Catholic University, and today I will be performing the eight-part eye exam. First is distance visual acuity. Good day, ma'am. So today we will be examining your eyes. So can you please take a step back? And then can you please occlude your left eye? And then read the lines for me. E F P T O Z L P E D P E C T D D D P C D P. Now can you please occlude your right eye for me and read again the letters? Repeat the steps for the left eye with the right eye covered. Now can you read the letters without covering any of your eyes? Retest the acuity with the patient using both eyes simultaneously. For patients with low vision, we may use our hand and ask the patient if how many fingers are shown. If the patient could not see the fingers, the examiner should move one foot closer to the patient. Do so until the patient can correctly identify the number. If the patient still could not identify the counting fingers, the examiner can wave her hand and ask the patient if she can identify the moving hand. If the patient still cannot see the examiner's moving hand, use the pen light and direct it on the patient's eye in all directions. The second part is the external eye exam. Observe the facial skin for any dermal or vascular changes. Note any lesions or evidence of trauma. Note any significant asymmetry of facial bones. Note the position of the upper and lower eyelids. We can also assess the effectiveness of eyelid closure and the strength of the orbicularis muscle. We can also palpate the bony orbit for any lesion or deformity. This concludes the external eye exam. The third part is the pupillary exam. A decreased room illumination would be helpful to visualize the pupils. Ask the patient to look straight ahead and use a pen light to examine the pupils of both eyes. The light can be shown directly into the eye by approaching it from side or from below. The direct pupillary response to light is recorded in terms of briskness of the response. Also observe the consensual reflex by noting the response of light of the non-illuminated pupil. Repeat all the steps for the opposite eye. Now I am going to perform the swinging flashlight test. To do this test, swing a light back and forth in front of the two pupils and compare the reaction to stimulation in both eyes. When light reaches a pupil, there should be a normal direct and consensual response. The relative afferent pupillary defect is diagnosed by observing a paradoxical dilatation when light is directly shown in the affected pupil after being shown in the normal pupil. By not being able to relay the intensity of light as accurately as a healthy pupil, the diseased side causes the visual pathway to mistakenly respond to the decrease in stimulation as if the flashlight itself were less illuminous. This explains the healthy eye is able to undergo both direct and consensual dilatation seen on the swinging flashlight test while the deceased eye could not. Some causes of RAPD include optic neuritis, ischemic optic disease or retinal disease, severe glaucoma, direct optic nerve damage, retinal detachment, and retinal infection. Now the fourth part is the motility exam. Now we are going to perform the motility exam. So can you just look straight ahead and then follow my finger without moving your head, okay? okay. Elevate the upper eyelid and observe for downward gaze. Now we are going to check for the corneal light reflex. Just look straight ahead. Compare the position of the two corneal light reflections and record the estimated result. 
Now the fifth part is the confrontation test. Okay, so now ma'am, we're going to do the confrontation test. So can you just look straight ahead? And then uh, cover your left eye for me. We're going to test your right eye, okay, with your left eye. So tell me how many fingers do you see? Two, one, four, three, okay. Two, one, three, five. So now, ma'am, we are going to test for your left eye. So can you include your right eye for me? Yes. For this case, the patient does not have any abnormality in visual field. If an abnormality is detected, the visual field affected can tell where the lesion is most probably located. The sixth part of the eye exam is a measurement of the intraocular pressure. This could be assessed using different methods. Examples of which are the Goldman applination tonometry, the Schott's indentation tonometry, and the digital tonometry. According to the American Academy of Ophthalmologists, Goldman applination tonometry is considered as the gold standard. It measures the amount of force required to flatten the corneal apex by a standard amount using a slit lamp attachment that uses the blue filter. On the other hand, the Schott's indentation tonometer is used to measure the intraocular pressure by measuring the depth produced on the surface of the cornea by a load of a known weight. The indentation of corneal surface is indirectly proportional to the intraocular pressure. Lastly, we have the digital tonometry or the palpation method. The intraocular pressure is estimated by the response of the eye to pressure applied by a finger. A firm to touch indicates a normal intraocular pressure, while a hard one indicates a high intraocular pressure. Now the seventh part of the eye exam is the ophthalmoscopy. So now we're going to do the phonoscopic exam. Now I'm going to test your right eye first. Okay. First check the red reflex at a distance of around 2 feet. This is the fundus. In viewing the fundus, we first have to find the optic disc by following the retinal blood vessels. From the optic disc, we follow the blood vessels outward to examine the four quadrants around the posterior pole. And then we check for the foveal reflex. And the last part of the eye exam is the slit lamp biomicroscopy. The slit lamp biomicroscope consists of three principal portions. We have the viewing arm that contains the eyepiece and the objective lens. There is also the illumination arm that contains the light source and many of its controls. And the last portion is the patient positioning frame that contains the headrest, the chin rest, and the handlebars. The slit lamp is indispensable for the detailed examination of virtually all tissues of the eye. It is routinely used for the examination of the anterior segment, which includes the anterior vitreous and those structures that are anterior to it. In addition to physical examination, the slit lamp is often used for tonometry, linear measurement of tissues or lesions, and ophthalmic photography. It can also be used in contact lens fitting. And that's it for the 8-part eye exam. Thank you for watching.